It's time. The ATM episode number 17. My name is Martin Devlin from The Platform. Mark Watto Watson joins me. We're talking black ferns and the future of rugby here in New Zealand. How to capture and not only that, but monetize this momentum. Cristiano Ronaldo, what the hell's going on there, mate? Are you just attention-seeking, or do you really have a beef? Adi Sam- Savia, not in the nominations for World Rugby Player of the Year. Israel Adesanya, apologize to me! we got lots to talk about, Mark, but let's kick it off with Saturday night at the stadium joyous and look you know and even if you are slightly cynical about the whole thing it was a world cup there was a title on the line i keep saying to you mate that this is just a group of people trying to win a world championship for new zealand and there was love in that stadium oh look it was a wonderful performance and i I think where we've been going with a lot of the criticisms has been the politicalization of the women's rugby but we saw against France that there's no need for that. If the product's good enough, it'll stand on its own two feet. And you didn't think that a game could get much better than the French semi-final, and it did. It reached new heights again. You're sitting there on the edge of your seat. One moment England had the lead. Next minute New Zealand took it back, and you thought, here we go. Only then for England to strike back, and suddenly you're sort of heads in your hands, and you're sort of looking down or looking to the heavens, asking for a little bit of help. And it's everything a World Cup final should have. And so hopefully, hopefully off the back of it, they can capitalise on it, because clearly it did create a lot of interest, it created a lot of nationalism, and um, and, and that's what, what it should be. But, you know, once again, the final's finished, and here we go with the propaganda again, that more people watch this than the 2015 Rugby World Cup, and, and the referee, the female referee, well, she was flawless in her performance, she was just remarkable, she got every one of the tough calls right, and, you know, this constant pushing off this political angle again. Why can't we just enjoy it for what it is without having to try and somehow manipulate the economy again? And to me, it just takes it the edge off it. Just leave it alone. Yeah, I agree. But man. now, the, ch- the challenge now for women's rugby, and you mentioned it there in the introduction, is how do they capitalise on this? Well, we saw the hockey team in 1976 winning Olympic gold. They couldn't do it. The All-Whites in 82, as we discussed last week, they couldn't do it. Uh, All-Whites again, 2010, they couldn't do it. You know, if New Zealand rugby is smart, you get England back down here in July for Bingo. three tests. Bingo. Or you get the French down here for three tests. There is no mucking around here. You have to move. Because the reality is Canada's not going to bring a crowd along and any of those other playing nations like Wales or Scotland. Or even yes, Australia. They've got, strong, yeah, yeah. they've got a strong point of view in the men's game, but it doesn't correlate to the women's game. And so they need to move, and they need to move quickly to keep this momentum going. Because I don't think it's fair that just on a lot of media hype and off the back of the novelty of a Rugby World Cup that the men's game continues to fund the women's game. Well, you know, there's many aspects are all to this, um, you know, and look, and I wrote an article for NBR this week and, you know, the title was, can women's rugby uh, be financially sustainable? And the answer is today, no, it can't. Right now it can't. I'm not saying that that doesn't mean in the future it can, but right now it can't. And so what it requires is, you're exactly right, is a lot of really big brains putting egos aside, getting the right people around the table to consider all the aspects of it, to ask questions like, and we had Steve Hansen on the program today and he, look, he's actually, you know, got right back down to basics mark he's saying things like you know it's fun you know sports meant to be fun the women's world cup brought fun you saw that with the faces with the crowd with the with the euphoria with the way that people behaved at eden park and he says men's rugby in new zealand isn't fun the professional game whether it's that whether it's sucked it out whether it's the constant criticism whether it's the expectations or whatever but we've kind of lost that and you know rugby in this country is a really serious business he says and somehow we've got to kind of prick that balloon and actually Take it back to the people because this is a different catchment and a hey, different. Hey, 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 hey! I'm sorry, Steve Hansen was responsible for taking rugby away from the people. Well, I find that actually almost insulting that he has come out and said that because he's the one that made it top heavy. He's the one that put himself and his own ego and his All Black team ahead of any other form of the rugby. So if he has said that, I find that completely. Oh come on, man! I mean, cut the guy some slack, man. For God's sake, what he's no, done I'm is he's realised his wrongs. Is what he's done. Oh. What he's realised his wrongs. He's actually humble enough to admit that. Perhaps there was a different way of doing it. Could have been done a different way. And now he's at peace and he would like to oh, explain. Oh, the, hey, the sun will come up in the morning. Yeah, it would. The damn sun will come up in the morning. We'll apologise to me. That was the whole point. And judge me on the 2019 World Cup. And we did and we gave him a knighthood. And now we're thinking about giving Wayne Smith a knighthood. 
I just struggle with all this crap, and it's always at the benefit of rugby. That's a very good point. I don't. I agree with you on this. You know, they're talking about parliamentary reception. They're talking about parades. Oh, look, that's all well and good for me because look, we've done it with the America's Cup. We've done it with the World Cup. We've done it with the All Whites. Good God, they had a parade, and 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 you know, after beating Bahrain. But in terms of knighthoods, look, I mean, this is a this is a conundrum. For me, the knighthood should always be reserved for somebody who's done something amazing in the community. I mean, somebody who actually coaches a sports team or plays sport. I've I've, I've never equal, equal, you know equalised with that. You know, but let's go back to this whole point about the women's game and how to develop it. Melody Robinson was on the program yesterday. He's got a million brilliant ideas. Got a master's actually thesis on how to monetize women's sport. They need to get her around the table. Mark, I don't believe that those bozos at New Zealand Rugby who have, you know, couldn't schedule a, a, a All Blacks test in, in, in Japan outside of the quarterfinal of the World Cup, who had the All Blacks 15 playing at the same time yesterday in England as the All Blacks. I mean, this is their marketing now, which is just absolute BS, isn't it? Are these the right people to sit down here now and go, OK, we can figure out how to actually get that customer base back through the door? I doubt it. And I, and I, and I I also believe the egos are so damn big that they won't ask for the right people to be involved. Mate, this is an organisation who still condone and still believe that resting our All Blacks through Super Rugby is somehow positive. Yeah. This is still a, 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 an organisation who somehow believes that Super Rugby is healthy and that we don't need club rugby, we don't need the NPC. Of course they can't do it. Of course they can't do it. These are just people with impressive CVs who tick boxes who have zero vision what. So ever, you know, it's all about the bottom line. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple, isn't it? As we said, get England over here, get France get over, over here, here yeah, yeah. And but get also, too, let the series stand on its own. Let's see if these women, outside of a women's rugby world cup, can genuinely start to monetize this product. Take the novelty away from it. Give the game seven months where people maybe have forgotten the euphoria of the weekend and see if this game can stand on its own two feet and find out where the economy is. And then you've got a base point, then you've got a starting point, and then you look to build. And in regards to player bonuses, player incomes, all the rest of it, well, then you actually have an economic model which you can say, hey, this is realistic. Look, at the moment, ladies, we appreciate what you've done, but it's still a semi-professional game. We're not quite there yet commercially. But we, but yeah, we've made great strides. I mean, that's the whole thing. Having said that, though, the head of World Rugby, and I was reading this article on News Hub, Alan Gilpin, who says, and I was quoting, that the women's game is now going to overtake the men's, uh, and he's saying that, you know, I mean, women's rugby is, is the growth aspect of the sport. In some ways, I agree with that, but but it's not going to overtake the men's. You can't tell me that next year the men's Six Nations is not going to sell out in England and the women's Six Nations is, and that all of a sudden over in the UK, that the women's club rugby that nobody goes to watch at the moment, that all of a sudden those stadiums are going to be full. I mean, it's this kind of stuff to me, which I find the, you know, the most offensive at all. You don't need to paint this a colour that it's not. You just need to be realistic with it. And when you get a guy like that, the head of world rugby, who comes out with just absolutely loot rot like this i really do worry because i think if these if these are the people in charge it's not going to actually be a sport that they capitalize on because their heads are in the clouds these are the same people mark who turned around and said we're going to take over the united states the rugby world cup there's going to be the biggest noise in american sport well it, the announcement of it never even made the news in america uh, you know, the United States Rugby Federation or Union, whatever it was, has declared itself insolvent a couple of years ago. I mean, these people live in la-la land, mate. They say these things in the media because they think it actually is a good thing for them to say. But in actual fact, again, it's the politicising of, of, of and, and I think it's to the detriment of the actual sport. Just be what, real what? and be realistic and stop being patronising to the women by, by coming out with these outlandish, stupid statements. But it goes back to my opening statement. We still do it here. We're still doing it after this Women's World Cup. I don't care what anybody says. You do not have to be a rocket scientist. You don't need to look at fraud statistics or cherry-picking statistics. No one in their right mind still believes that Saturday night was bigger than the 2015-2011 Rugby World Cup for the men's. I had to watch that women's final slightly delayed. I was coming back from some commentary where I was absolutely shocked that quarters away at night how much traffic was actually on the motorway. I stopped in to get something to eat. The bar that I was there was not packed. It was not full. However, I remember 2011, 2000 vividly, the, basically the country stopped, the roads were dead, and those bars were filled. Did she have the perfect game as the referee? She probably went okay, but it wasn't flawless. It wasn't somehow, how come she got it right, and yet every male referee can't seem to get it right. Stop with the angle. Again, Martin, 
just reinforcing what you've just said. Lovely summation from you. I'm still absolutely horrified, and I still can't get out of my mind what Steve Hansen said. Apologise to me! Let's move on to my man Cristiano Ronaldo. Why on earth has he done this Piers Morgan interview? Because he's got a huge ego, because he's not getting any attention, because he knows when he speaks the world stops, because he's one of the, 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 the biggest sporting names on the planet. But to, to stain your legacy at the club, to slag the club, to slag the coach and things, I mean, you know, and Man United put out this absolutely just pap three-sentence statement saying today, oh, we're going to absorb what he says and maybe we'll make a call. Just say what the rest of us are saying. You know, Cristiano, you, you know, you're, you're, you're a wonderful player. You did great things for us, but you're slagging the club now and, and go. I mean, that's how most fans are feeling. I mean, I don't want to hear any more of this. Well, I think there's probably an element of truth in what he is saying, but taking it public, taking it the way he's done it is probably not the right way to do it. It's something I would probably do, Martin, and I can tell you that sort of stuff hasn't always um, played in my favour. No. Fact, you know, probably stuff I've regretted uh, later doing and getting caught up in, in the emotion of it all. Uh, look, you know, great players don't use their position of greatness to suddenly put the boot into somebody to suddenly say, hey, I know better, I'm the man, and can arrogantly get away with it. And I think this is a mark on his greatness now. You know, Michael Jordan, I'm sure, would have had some major issues at the time, but he just got on with it, he got on with it. You know, he might have come out later and said some things and sort of told his story, but during it, they hold their head high, and the great players do. And yeah, really, really surprised. Um, look, I think Manchester United would be silly if they didn't take some of it on board. Um, you know, he's probably there is probably some merit in what he says. But look, he's past his best. He's thirty seven years of age. He's arguably the biggest name in the sport, I, I would say, since Diego Maradona. I know a lot of people are talking about Messi. Oh, okay, but, but you know, there has been players like Ronaldo, but you know, certainly along with Messi, the biggest name in sport. I think he's got the largest social media following in the world yeah, as a yeah. person. And so, you know, and he's earned that right. Um well he, some people can say that he's earned that right, but it's still how you go about doing it. Piers Morgan will be loving it because this has put him back in the profile, and I'd imagine this has put a lot of focus on what he's trying to do in terms of reinventing himself. So well done to Piers Morgan. Hey, box ticking, oh, let's not kid ourselves. We'd all love that interview, wouldn't we? Um, the relationship between Manchester United and Ronaldo is well and truly over now. Mind you, Manchester United, well, they were over 10 years ago, weren't they? Oh, that's nasty, mate. I mean, oh, that's nasty. Look at the points table before we go to the World Cup. Speaking of which, do you, you know, how do you feel right now about all of a sudden it seems to be gaining momentum? The players are coming out. Maybe some other personalities are talking about it. I mean, there are still plenty of them, including Dave and Beckham, have taken millions of dollars to be a spokesperson for Qatar. The thing is, Mark, and this is the truth, it doesn't matter what anyone says now, and it doesn't matter, you know, whether they get all political about it or get all uprighteous about it or anything else. The fact is, Everyone's still going. All the teams are still going. None of the players are pulling out. None of the major sponsors are pulling out of FIFA. They're all renewing their contracts. And I will be watching the World Cup just like you will because because of the sport involved. It's 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 got a filthy aspect to it, is it? But I mean, in the end, what can you do? I mean, they you know, Seth Blatter's turned around. He says, "Oh, it should never have gone there." You're the you're the friggin' guy who actually rubber stamped it. You gave it to Putin. You got the you got the Qatari money, and you it's so corrupt. But what do we do? We're going to watch the tournament, aren't we? Of course we are. I mean, it goes back to South Africa 2010. You can take it back four years earlier than that. I mean, every FIFA Football World Cup, as far as I can remember, has basically been bought. It's never been a, a, a transparent process. You think of FIFA, you just think of um, corruption. You go back to the IOC, you just think mm. of Juan Antonio Samara. Yeah. You think of all of these big sports organisations. I mean, look, there's a major investigation going on at the moment in France regarding the organising committee for next year's Rugby World Cup. These people come along with the best intentions. They get a wee taste. They get their nose in the trough and they like what they've, they like what's in front of them. And, you know, suddenly it becomes a little bit of an addiction. I mean, you look at the human rights of Qatar, you look at um, their attitudes towards homosexuality and stuff, and it goes against, I guess, the belief system of certainly most of the Western world. But yeah, these right, these players will stand up. Australia will virtually signal they'll all do it, but none of them are actually prepared to really stand up and protest and not go because they don't really believe in it. They don't really believe in it, like the Australian women's netball team that want to turn down a fifteen million dollar contract because of a statement made forty years ago by the owner of that particular mine company, yet they're more than happy to go to the Commonwealth Games in three years' time, which is the absolute 
utter symbol of oppression and colonisation. But, you know, hey, we pick and choose, don't we? Because we don't really mean it. At the end of the day, everything I do is all about me, me, me. What can I get out of it? But, hey, if you're going to pull my bluff, if you're going to call my bluff, I, I, I think I might just fold and then suddenly shut up shop. So I'm with you, Martin. I'm looking forward to it thoroughly and looking forward to it. I think it's absorbing. Um, I, I couldn't pick a winner right now. Um, but yeah, usual no, suspects, um, mate. There's only eight teams that ever won it. One of those teams is not there, Italy. So pick out of the other seven. Apologise to me. Finally, then, Adi Savia, not in the nominations for World Player of the Year. Uh, Lucano Arm, who's the South African centre, had a great rugby championship. We know that. Look, you know, when it comes to this, I'm looking at you. Either got the the Six Nations or the Rugby Championship contained within those ten teams, are probably the nine, if not all ten, of the best teams right now in the world. So the Player of the Year's got to come from those. If you're watching the Rugby Championship, how could you ignore the form of Adi Savia? I mean, come on, that's just a, that's just silliness, isn't it? Well, that's just the rest of the world just dying for the opportunity to put the boot into the All Blacks. There you go. That's and, exactly I mean, what it is. It, that, that, that is just, they've just been waiting for this chance, haven't they? have been waiting years to just suddenly be able to promote themselves and promote their players. I mean, if you ask any serious coach in the world, which loose forward would you like to have in your current team? Every single one of them on the damn planet will go arty severe against any one of their starting players. The guy is unbelievable. What's made it even special, he's been playing in a forward pack that's been going backwards. Yeah, Martin. good point. Yeah. He's, been he's been playing in a team that have been absolutely woeful at times and has still shown. That's the measure of him. It's easy for the likes, not necessarily, I'm not certainly taking anything away from their skill set, but it's easy for McCaw and Carter and the all-black team when they're going forward and you've got guys like Jerome Kano and you've got locks who are at the peak of their powers and a front row that's at the peak of its powers. Yes, those guys are going to stand out, they're going to be given the room, they're going to be given the time to absolutely exert themselves and show their skill set. Savi has actually had to do it off the back foot. And how this guy is not nominated is just another blight on rugby. It just shows how political this is, that there is no transparency, there is no actual due diligence done. It's just all about he said, she said, you did this to me, I'm going to do it to you type mentality. Um, hey, by the way, too, um, I, I, I saw the headline regarding Dave Rennie not having the right to make the 16 or 17 changes that he made to the Australian team that ended up getting beaten by Italy for the first time in 30-odd years. I'll, I'll say the same thing about Ian Foster. I don't think Ian Foster had the right and had earned the right to make that many changes, and it almost came back and it almost cost us another test match. Devlin. I'm as tired as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. The Platform.